Hello, everyone. Welcome to Multiple Calls, episode 37. I'm Scott Hewlett. How do you know when you're talking to a firefighter? They've told you 12 times. Some things are funny because they're true. Even stating that you're trying to become a firefighter seems to bring with it some expectation that others will be impressed and admire you, and it's often the case. Because the public doesn't know when we are mediocre or even poor when we are called to perform, they are filtering you through the fantasy image of what they hope a firefighter to be, on and off the job. And therefore you are no longer just an average person in their eyes. You are something altogether different. And for some, this instant, effortless identity is like a drug. It fills whatever void existed in their lives. In some cities, add in the work schedule, the pay, benefits, pension, and how few times you are called to do something challenging, and there is before firefighting, and there is the lottery win. Some may find it in them to rise to the status that those before them have earned them, and some won't. Why would you fight to get better when everyone just tells you you're amazing as you are? This isn't a sales pitch. It's a danger sign. The flip side to this is the challenge of finding your feet in the fire service when you've done the personal and professional work and had the life experiences to know who you are before you chose the career. If you don't have an identity, the service will give you one. But if you already do, it might not like it. There is a balance of discerning and integrating the parts of the culture that serve to help you grow and improve to be an effective part of the team and staying true to yourself, standing your ground, and tactfully pushing back when you are legitimately treated unfairly. Fortunately, those coming in with a higher level of self-identity and life experience often have the maturity to navigate the former well, even though it might be a disenchanting, disheartening, and difficult thing to go through. My guest this episode entered the service having already achieved a high level of athletic success and completing years as a psychotherapist. Through trial and tribulation, he found his way to incorporate and be incorporated into this additional identity as a firefighter. It's a pleasure to bring you Matt Johnston. Hey, Matt. Hey, Scott. How are you? Doing good, thanks. Great. Glad we're having the time to talk today. Yeah, absolutely. It's long overdue. I've been following your work for quite a while, and it's really awesome to connect with you. Well, let's start with where you're originally from and tell me about your family and your upbringing. Okay. Well, I was born in the late 70s in Kelowna. It's a city that's changed quite a bit in the Okanagan since I uh, lived there. Mum was a stay-at-home mom. Dad worked on the railway as a foreman. And my mom went back to school in the early 1980s. And part of her completing her education meant that she'd move out to Burnaby to go to a technical institute to finish her degree. So we, when I was five, moved to the lower mainland here in Vancouver and been here ever since. And how is your upbringing family dynamic? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one. Well, I know we're probably going to get into the whole idea of a helping role. And from my perspective, when I reflect back on my life, the interest in helping others definitely comes from a very personal level. My dad was a foreman on the railway. And in 1980, he was working, laying ties on the railway and working in collaboration with the steel gang that would lay these tracks. So the steel gang were being transported to another location as they repaired the railway. And when they transported these young men in a school bus, they collided with a liquid asphalt tractor trailer just outside of Swift Current, Saskatchewan. And given that my dad was the only one with a radio, the steel gang foreman radioed him and said there's been a major accident. So my dad attended that scene and there was absolute carnage, apparently. And to this day, it remains the highest number of fatal injuries suffered in Saskatchewan, even more fatalities than Humboldt. And the young men that were on there were between 18 and 25 years old. And my dad had to transport many of the people that were still alive. So long story short is he had to identify the bodies after the incident. And from what I hear from my family is CP Rail basically gave him unlimited access to alcohol to quell the thoughts and feelings that accompanied this event. And when he returned to work, he couldn't really focus on his job. And so he was let go. And that kind of led to the demise of his life and his relationship with my mom. 
So when I talk about moving to Vancouver, that was a transition of my mom going from marriage to being single and starting over. So you can imagine, you know, early 1980s in Vancouver, single mom, full-time student. I grew up with not a lot of rental rules and what have you because my mom was busy in school and my sister was six years older than me. So, you know, I had a lot of freedom growing up that I still look back and love, but obviously not a lot of direction from parents involved in my life throughout the day, right? Kind of a latchkey kid. Yeah. Now, I guess looking back, knowing what you know now and the education you have, it's so much to process and unpack from the empathy and compassion and understanding part of you and the thinking back to what you missed out on. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I didn't really grow up feeling like I missed out on anything. But then as I got older and switched careers, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but going from a mental health practice full time, being a small business owner to immersed in male dominated culture was very novel to me because I'd grown up in a single parent household with an older sister and then was in a profession that was 80% female. So it was in my mid 30s when I started to realize the gaps in personal experience that I had in terms of a male presence or influence in my life. And that's been an interesting journey. My dad passed away about a year and a half ago. So it's allowed me to kind of reflect on my life and think about the father that I'm trying to be for my 12 year old son. And that's kind of the interesting thing about family is you can kind of use your family as role models for what you want to be growing up or watch vicariously and say, those are the type of choices I don't want to make in my generation. And I've taken the good and the bad from my family and tried to push it onto my life and pursue it from a personal excellence standpoint rather than a perfectionist standpoint living within my value system in a way that can contribute to my son's well-being and my community as a whole. Do you think growing up in a mostly female peer environment and then in your mental health work in that female energy dominated workplace and then getting into that male dominated service, you have a lot to integrate together. Do you feel that's a great benefit to you that maybe some people are missing in the service that weren't exposed to or allowed to express maybe the traits that come with that environment in a positive way in their own lives? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've always felt like I've been more of an observer to fire culture. And when I was hired 10 years ago, there was still a very stoic presence within my personal workplace. I work for a large department of 400 members, and since I've been hired, there's probably 150 new members underneath me. I've noticed generationally the millennials are a unique crowd that is changing the way that mental health is talked about in the hall, and it's kind of bringing along people that were traditionally stoic. And so I don't feel like I'm an observer anymore. I feel like I'm immersed in a culture that is becoming more inclusive and diverse in terms of opinion, gender, ethnicity. And on a macro level, that's what we all want in every workplace. But for me personally, this transition has allowed me to feel more connected to the brother and sisterhood of the fire service that I thought existed when I was hired, but I didn't really feel it early on, partly because as a probationary firefighter, you you don't feel like you're part of the team for the first few years, which is somewhat normal. But I'm really liking the change that I'm seeing in the fire culture. I've noticed that in my own work with even dealing with patients and processing calls afterwards, that having that integration of your emotions and your compassion and empathy with the stoicism that sometimes is required, finding that razor's edge between the two actually makes you a better first responder, not the opposite. Have you found that? Absolutely. As I'd mentioned to you before the podcast, I had COVID about five or six weeks ago, and I'm mostly fully recovered now. It's just my sense of smell and taste. But there were some really sketchy days in early April where I was really wondering about my health. And sure enough, I go to a call four days ago on the fire truck, and I'm driving. So I'm not going to be the primary patient care individual. 
But the typical worst case scenario update, 44 year old male, unconscious, not breathing, no pulse, and children are performing CPR. So I looked over to my captain and I said, hey, Cap, once I park the truck, I'm going to take care of the kids. And it wasn't like this knight in shining armor idea, but more like I need to decompress the gravity of the situation. And my captain understood what I was saying. When I got into the patient's townhouse, the kids were at the top of the stairs being observers of what was happening with dad with patient care. And I was just like, boys, come on downstairs. And we chatted for about 45 minutes about video games. My goal was to be present, but to distract them from the magnitude of what was going on and mom's reactions, the visceral sounds and feelings that she was expressing. And I cleared that scene with my captain and my other two firefighter colleagues. I could tell the importance of patient care, not necessarily being what I would say like an ABC style of a patient care, but one that involves a little bit more of emotional intelligence. And instead of just going in and then clearing the scene five minutes later and having a coffee, what can we do to enhance the care that those children are going to have and remember about the fire service? And for me, having gone through COVID and having a child that's 12 years old and pretty much the same age as this patient, it hit me on a pretty personal level in the sense of, I'm not too far removed from potentially having been in that scenario that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world have now been through with the pandemic. So I'm in a very fortunate place in my health and that I'm fully recovered and I'm looking forward to summer. But I take these calls and they motivate me to find my place in my community in a way that I think adds tremendous value to me rather than more rocks in my backpack, so to speak. That close hit to home can either leave you with just the worry and fear and the terror, perhaps, of what you skirted, or it can help you dive deeper into that, not patient care, but patient caring. Yeah, good way to frame it. Absolutely. Patient caring is something, it's interesting, you know, my senior firefighter is 14 years on the job. And when we cleared, he looked at me, he's like, Matt, we need more training in this area where we're not just clearing the scene. That's such a firefighter thing to do to go in, mitigate the problem and then disappear. And I really liked what you mentioned about caring model. And that's not really taught in at least my province around how to have some emotional presence with your patients. And I think when I look back on how child development works, because that's my background and training, those two boys will likely remember that day as a series of light bulb memories that will never leave them. And when I left that scene, I felt a sense of if we don't get one call this set or this month, I feel like that incident has provided me the sense of purpose that I need that will keep me motivated to continue lifelong learning and combat any sort of compassion fatigue that I might have been suffering from with patients that are routine calls that you go to three, four times a day that kind of generally wear you down. So it's interesting how these incidents can serve as motivators over time to reignite your sense of interest in the career. Yeah. And also now that you chose that action and behavior during that call, when you think back to that call, when you talk to me about it right now, you carry forward with you that feeling and not necessarily just hinging on the outcome of did we bring the person back that we originally called there for? Yeah. The way my brain works is I'm very process oriented, not necessarily outcome based. And if I worked in a hospital setting, I think outcome based would be much more important because you kind of see where the patient goes in terms of life or death, and you have interventions to mitigate that. But I'm really accepting that my relationship as a firefighter with these patients is very basic. To mitigate risk, it's to package them and get them in an ambulance so that they can get hospital care. I'm okay with not knowing the outcome. I don't really have any sort of curiosity of knowing. And I've been to over 3,000 calls now. I don't really remember any calls until I'm driving around my city and then going, oh, yeah, I remember that call in that intersection. 
everyone's experience is quite different with potentially traumatic events. I don't know if it's my counseling background, but I find I kind of digest these things quite easily, just having my boundaries. And they're not rigid boundaries. They're just the way my memory seems to work. Well, and you're just aware of them and hold to them and operate within them. Yeah, absolutely. The last thing that I was thinking about when you were talking about that call is, I don't think it's too far a stretch to say this, but that interaction with those children in that moment that could potentially be life-saving for them down the road. Yeah. You know, when I left the scene, the last thing I said to those two boys, I've got a 3M respirator on, right? Because of COVID PPE protection and goggles. It's not the most intimate setting to connect from one soul to another. But I had built up enough rapport over the first 45 minutes with them that whenever I spoke, they listened. And I just looked at them and I said, boys, just remember this one thing I'm going to tell you, you will have each other through anything that you encounter in life. I used to be a youth worker in the downtown east side of Vancouver and kids I would never felt like I ever connected with would run up to me years later and go, Matt, you know, that one thing you said changed my life. And I don't even remember what I had said to them and vice versa things that I thought would really impact a child's life, they don't remember. So whether those boys remember it or not, I just felt like what I needed to tell them in the moment was, you guys have each other through this. You're going to get through anything life throws at you. And that was kind of my way of hopefully forming a lasting memory of a really, really tragic day in their lives. Yeah, as a crew, you walk in with these hard skills the defib and the bvm and doing compressions and you don't know if it's actually going to be the difference but you do it because there is the potential that it's going to make a difference so why don't we do these soft skills and make that connection you don't have to know what's going to make a difference you just have to do it because there's the potential that it's going to make a difference absolutely you know the saying well we do the best we can with the tools we have at the time we have them And for me, that really contains the role that we play as frontline first responders and servicing a city that has 800,000 people in it. There's going to be a lot of tragedy and setback in a city that large. And for me, I just tell myself, I didn't create this. I'm doing my best to mitigate it and save lives and property. But if I don't do that, and I've done my best, that's all I think we can ask for. And That's really over the years allowed me to really contain any sort of potentially traumatic memories that I've encountered on the job to the point where I think they're significant memories. They're memories that I can quickly recall and maybe remember vivid details of, but they don't really impact me that I can tell on a daily basis. Other life stressors, I can't say the same for, but (laughs) but in terms of calls, that's kind of how it's gone for me. So let's digress. We'll dive back to growing up. Tell me about your athleticism or hobbies as a young kid. Yeah, well, as you can imagine, based on what I was mentioning on my upbringing, I became very independent. My sister was six years older than me, so it wasn't like we were ever at the same developmental age. And my mom was and continues to be an incredibly hard worker. And I think that's where I got my hard work and stubbornness from. And so I remember immersing myself in buying bikes because I had three paper routes when I was 12, always incredibly hardworking, too much so when I look back on it. But the bikes were funded by these paper routes I had. So I had like five or six bikes and I'd spend hours taking them apart and trying to put them back together. And I just had a really curious mind. And one day I was running in my complex and my mom took a picture of me and said Matt you know you look like a really good runner and I didn't think anything of it little did I know that running was going to take me around the world and fund my education when I was in grade 8 I was running in gym class and you know you had the best athlete who was the best goalie he was in hockey baseball whatever and I just was like screw it why is this kid always beating everyone at everything so I remember running beside him in gym class and I was going to some pretty rough schools and he didn't like me running beside him. So he pushed me, I don't know if it was jokingly or maliciously, but into the goalpost as we were running beside each other. And I got up and I'm like, no, this isn't going to happen. And so we got into this race in gym class. I mean, I absolutely 
crushed the guy in the second half of the run. And the gym teacher was like, Matt, you've got a real natural running talent. And I was five foot eight and on the basketball team at the time. And I said, well, I'm making the NBA. I'm not into this distance running (laughs) stuff. I was MVP that year, the basketball team, believe it or not. I was actually a decent point guard, but my running was something that I was really gifted at. And in grade 11, I went to the BC High School Track Championships and I was in the 5,000 meters. So it's 12 and a half laps. And I ended up getting lapped by the winner. And I couldn't believe that it happened to me, even though I'd only trained for like two months. And, you know, just this at risk kid that had tons of drive, but sometimes misdirected energy. And I remember throwing my running spikes off and saying to my coach, this isn't fucking going to happen again. He goes, well, you got to start training. I don't think you're going to make the NBA because I kept saying I was going to make the NBA instead of running. So lo and behold, I trained from there on in. And when I graduated high school, I was the top distance runner in my province in two events. And I was such a late bloomer to the running scene that my graduating year was when I ended up becoming a double gold medalist at the provincial level. And all the recruiting and scholarships were already taken over for that year. I live near Simon Fraser University, and my coach is just like, you got to sign this guy to the head coach of the track team at the time. And that was a life altering moment for me where. I went from feeling basically invisible, skinny distance runner in the hallways of a large high school to being this track star that everyone knew about. I came from a football school that won provincials both years that I was there. They were kind of touted as the best high school team in history in BC. And when I graduated high school, I was basically at that level of intrigue from the school because I'd won this international high school race in Chicago. And one of the interesting things was I flew back the same night as the award ceremony for the athletic banquet at the high school. And I walked into standing ovation because I guess the principal had announced that morning that I'd won this international prep track meet in Chicago. You know, that level of notoriety for a kid that came from my background was life altering. And then To get a full scholarship to SFU was the turning point for setting my life on a completely different trajectory. I really cherished those five years that I was a student athlete at SFU, and it set my life on a different course and one that has had pros and cons to it in terms of my independence and drive, but for the most part, pursuing personal excellence, intrinsic motivation is kind of what guides every decision I make in my life. You and I are old enough where we remember watching after school specials. I think what you just described was a great script for one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, people are always surprised. I don't know what it is about my presence, but people often think that I come from somewhat of a privileged background. You know, I had a master's from UBC at 26 and my running background and professional firefighter, I often feel misunderstood, probably like most people do in society. But just in terms of when people hear my background and upbringing and where I am today, they assume, you know, I grew up in an upper middle class family with parents that were happily married and loved each other. But that certainly wasn't the case for me. So before we move ahead to your academic path, you mentioned to me when we were talking about athleticism that running taught you just how difficult success can be, but how important hard work it is to achieving your goals. So maybe you just expand on that for me. Yeah, so many different ways to expand on that. I mean, ultimately, running is something that you can never perfect. The world record in the 5,000 meters is never going to be zero seconds. And so no matter what level you're at, whether you're the world record holder or a fringe national team athlete like I was, the goals are relative. The intrinsic drive to do the best you can has kind of permeated through every area of my life. And I've just seen opportunity at every twist and turn that life has presented to me. I don't know if that kind of sheds light on your question or not, but that's kind of where I was going. 
Yeah, what I was thinking about when you mentioned the world record for the 5,000 meter will never be zero seconds is that's a good analogy for the fire service. I've often said to myself and to rookies that I've been mentoring is that everything we do takes a certain amount of time and all we can try and do is do it in the fastest time we can, but do it properly. But that's the physical and time constraint limitation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what's made the fire service very compatible for me on a different level than what we were talking about earlier is the energy that I put in at a fire scene or at any sort of emergency situation. I try and achieve the same type of thing that I did in running, which is not pursuing something that is unrealistic. It's about mitigating and doing your best. And I think that's what allows me to put my head on my pillow at night and feel like I'm having a meaningful contribution to the community. And I've taken that for granted over the years. I I just assume everyone has that feeling of connection to community. But the older I get, the more I realize how few people actually feel that their profession or their life is really having an impact on others. And that's really sad in today's day and age that people feel that way. I'm just very fortunate that that isn't my issue. I've got other ones, but that one isn't. (laughs) (laughs) We're fortunate. It's a privilege to get paid for just being who you are. Yeah, it's a real gift. You mentioned the scholarship to SFU. Now walk me through that drastic change in trajectory and what the process was from there. (laughs) Well, SFU is a very academic institution. I did my master's at UBC, and I think about how hard my undergrad was versus graduate school. My track coach, the first week of September, gave me a course list, and I didn't even register for the courses. He registered for me because I didn't get in until the week prior because of my grades and how late everything was in getting processed. He put me in a math class that just blew me out of the water. I ended up having to swap courses. And to maintain my scholarship, I had to have a 2.0, maybe a C, C plus average. And it got pretty dicey there my first couple of semesters because I didn't really know how to learn. I had gone to seven or eight schools between elementary and high school because we moved wherever my mom could find work. And I was playing catch up big time. I was used to kind of faking it until you make it, but this whole undergrad bell curve thing was definitely a stretch for me. But every semester got better. I fell in love with psychology, but truth be told, the reason why I did psychology was because I was avoiding having to take math classes. (laughs) (laughs) And in my third year university, I realized that I needed a math 12 to get into a math class that was required. It was quantitative data class for my psych degree. So I actually, in my third year, went back to my high school to do night classes to get my grade 12 math. And that was really strange for me. And ironically, the psych 210 prof at the time was one of the top runners in SFU history. He was this brilliant mind. I'm sure he's still working there. When I had it in my test at the midterm out of a class of 200, he's like, I really follow your running. You're really good. And I'm like, how do you know me? But I got to know him after finishing the course. I I was being honest with him. I said, Mike, this was the most intimidating experience of my life taking this course. I had to go back to night school and do my grade 12 math just to get in. And he goes, oh, you should have let me know that. I would have waived that course. (laughs) (laughs) Jeez. Balancing a full course load with running full time and going to my high school for night class was the most harrowing six month routine of my life. So I didn't know if I wanted to hug him or hit him (laughs) for telling me that in hindsight. Yeah. You got to wonder, though, if you'd feel the same or if it's even in your personality to think, hey, I wonder because we're connected in running, if you could just do me a solid and wave this course. Is it even in you to do that? Yeah, it never crossed my mind. But for me, Scott, it made me realize that you got to start asking for things that you want. And for me, being highly independent as a child, I just powered through getting the paper route done. I never asked anyone to help me. And that's kind of been one of my Achilles heels in life is just doing everything myself. And, you know, in my early 40s, I don't know if it's common, but for me, I've just been reflecting on my life and where I want it to take me. 
And being able to rely on others is something that I really want to establish in the second half of my life, hopefully, that goes until my 80s or 90s. But that's something that I think the fire service has slowly taught me over the years is to rely on someone and teamwork is the key. Many hands leading to light lifting. I'm literally just learning that now myself too. So the timing's about right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It might be a common thing in our age group, right? Of reflecting on where life has taken us and where we want it to go and being planful about it. And also the idea that letting people help you is actually giving something to them. Like they get to have the experience of helping you through something. So you're actually stealing something from people if you don't let them have that experience with you. I agree with that for sure. How did the Canadian national team come about? Oh, that's an interesting story too. I would love to say that I finished university and like transitioned seamlessly, but I finished my running career at SFU. I was working full time. I'd gained weight. By that, I mean 15 pounds onto my 130 pound frame from when I was running. So I wasn't overweight, but I wasn't at the same caliber of running fitness. It didn't work out with this nonprofit I was working for. And I had some downtime in the fall of 2002. I've always wanted to go to Australia and I want to train. I want to get back into my running fitness. So I had moved to Australia in February thinking that I'd be there for a year. And typical how my life has gone last minute, five days before I leave, there's an application to a master's in education program at UBC. So I scurried to get that application in on time, didn't think I'd get in, but at least it kind of made me feel like I had a larger scope with where my life is going. So I went down to Australia and I ran and lived with a guy that was at the time top 10 in the world as a distance runner. And it really elevated my game. I remember having a a layover in Tokyo. And when I unboarded the plane, the Nike store had a large billboard of this guy that I was going to live and train with. Wow, this is for real. In Canada, you know, I was maybe top 15 in the country in my events. I had come third in 1999 at Canadian Champs that kind of put me on the national scene. But I wasn't legitimately at that level, in my opinion. And so to this guy, I was like a walk-on kind of recruit in his eyes. And it made me realize how relative my personal best were compared to his. And the standard that many people think about is a four-minute mile, right? And to him, that was just like something he could do in his sleep. And so his level of excellence in running really started to wear off on me. And I never got to his level, but I came back to Canada and I ended up getting into grad school. So I only stayed in Australia for three months. And that fall was when I made my first Canadian national team. And that's kind of the next chapter post-university was three years after graduation, I make my first national team. And that allowed me to run full time as a nationally carded athlete so I could afford to train properly and not have to do a 40 hour a week grind at the job and try and run 100 miles a week. So that was a big break for me, similar to getting a full scholarship there back in 1996 when I graduated high school. I get the sense that you've always been internally motivated and driven. Yeah, to a fault, actually. I find myself, even with my friends, censoring what I'm doing or what I'm up to because I'm not a boastful or egocentric person, at least I don't think I am. But I find that when I start describing things that I'm working on and my vision for how I think my company is going, I can't help but to feel like I may be overwhelming them. So I try to just kind of keep it within myself, which is paradoxical to what I'd mentioned earlier about sharing more experiences and being more collective in my mentality. There's something within me that kind of goes, ah, slow down on what you're talking about and just try and ask your friends how their life is going, which the clinical counselor in me should be very good at, but I work hard every day at being a good listener still. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the loneliness of a distance runner. Oh, yeah. Well, it's funny because, you know, on the West Coast, it rains here a lot, as everyone knows, and six, seven months out of the year, it's dark by 4.30 in the afternoon. And it's one of those things where 
running in two or three degree weather and really ice cold rain was worse than running in minus 25 weather in Winnipeg. To slog away at that, and it sounds bad, but to have your nipples bleed because your shirt got wet and rub them for 20 kilometers, <laughs> to pull toenails off, like I know this sounds really bad, but this is the kind of stuff that was routine in my life for quite a while. And it hardens you like forged steel in that your mindset to life and your internal thought process just becomes so driven in mostly a good way. People talk about mindfulness and the importance of being present. And the strange thing about running was it was a meditative experience for me almost every single time when I look back on it. It allowed me to come back with really creative thoughts, almost like, you know, a psychedelic experience. And when I think back on some of the ideas and thoughts I had that have now even become my reality, it was a deep process that when we think about the power of breath work, that's the magic of running is that you might be breathing at a fairly shallow level. But when you're running 15 kilometers an hour, you can't help but to start breathing diaphragmatically. And the benefits of that was far outreaching than what I've ever achieved in yoga or some intentional guided meditation, which I completely endorse. But I'm just saying from my experience as a loneliness of a distance runner, that's something that to this day, 15 years out of running at a high level, I still really kind of miss and look for reinventing in my life in some capacity. So you really have intimate knowledge and experience of what a lot of people phrase as embracing the suck. There's benefits that come from that that you can't get in any other way. Yeah. And you know where I think I've found it in other ways, Scott, is when I look at my career, I mean, I'm kind of immersed in my fourth or fifth legit profession at 42. And I love learning about different things. I went from being a full-time play therapist to a fully qualified firefighter within four months. And by that, I mean, I had my class three driver's license. I got my medical certification. I completed my NFPA seals in Texas. And I did that all within four months. One of the happiest days of my life, my biggest accomplishment was getting my class three license. I signed up on a Monday for the course and I took the road test on a Thursday and I never thought I'd pass it. And it's just interesting how personal accomplishments work because that was more satisfying than most of the races I won as a distance runner. The whole fake it till you make it kind of thing. I was just like, what have I gotten myself into? And that's what I love about the part of my fire career that I'm in now is I don't feel like I have to fake it anymore. I'm in hazardous materials. I'm driving a fire truck. I attended thousands of medical calls. And I feel like I've finally arrived in terms of feeling comfortable as a firefighter. And not that I've seen it all or have perfected the profession. I don't think that's ever possible for anyone. But I do feel like when I get to the fire hall, whether it's a fire or a rescue MVA, I feel comfortable in any role in that truck, obviously, other than captain, because I just feel like the rote training has finally shifted my mind enough to not feel like an observer anymore, but a witness to the profession. I think what you're describing is what, if people are paying attention to it, that's when you realize that you are a firefighter. That's when you become it, not when you get hired. A lot of people tie to the identity with the title, and it doesn't happen for years. No, you're so right on that. And I've never thought about that until you just mentioned it. I got hired at 34. So my identity was pretty much fused to my mental health background. And that's why I kind of felt like a bit of an outsider. Well, I did feel like a big outsider early on. But around five years or so, I started seeing even from my hiring class, guys that were saying that they felt they didn't fit in. And I was looking at them like, oh, my God, if only I was six foot four and (laughs) my uncle was a captain on the job, man, would I ever feel like I fit in? And those were the guys saying to me, I have a hard time sleeping the night before my first day shift. And that's when a eureka moment came on with me when it came to mental health and the fire service. This is 
something that needs to be talked about and can be so much more progressive and innovative compared to the culture that we find ourselves in and in almost every public safety group across Canada. You mentioned in your notes to me that this past year has changed you a lot and you're learning to take better care of yourself and nurture that inner child and not have to work so hard. Did some of that come from your work as a counselor? The shift is now, I guess, from that timeline happening during your time as a firefighter. So was it the two experiences together? Like, how did that come about for you? Well, I think it came about because I started to realize that my body was breaking down a bit. I had some unique pains that my doctor would say, oh, it's just age related and what have you. And people close to me, like my mom was just like, Matt, you always just wear yourself down. And and I remember laying in bed at night going, I am taking my body for granted. I don't even think about the harm I'm doing to it by working so hard and physically pushing myself. And when I saw the fragility of life through COVID, that also coincided with some of the feelings I was having with my body, like my back aches and stuff. If I don't start being a friend to my body and checking in, I am going to wear it out and be a statistic rather than someone that I think a lot of my peers feel like they can go to in times of need. And so the mental health side, I go to therapy regularly. I believe in it. I think everyone in society could benefit from it. My mental health was something that I've always been attuned to, but my physical health, I've taken for granted. And I've made a pact with myself that I'm not going to fall down that rabbit hole of just crushing my body in any area of my life. I'm going to do things in a controlled manner whether it's my heart health or breathing or what have you, I'll work hard. I'm not going to do it in a naive way, which I, I think I'd done for pretty much my whole life. Yeah, and there's a way to do that and be super effective as a firefighter and do your job at the same time. Yeah, reflecting back right now, when I think of my childhood, no one ever taught me how to take care of myself. I taught myself that. And the way that my little brain worked at 12 was that you just have to work hard, that the sheer willpower is what's going to allow you to overcome any obstacle in your life. And that works really well when you're trying to maintain a scholarship at a big university and you can balance it without academics. But when you enter the real world of work and life and fatherhood and mortgages and stuff like that, that can be a recipe for disaster in terms of anxiety and things go from being a challenge to something that becomes a checkbox. And that's something that I want to stop doing. I don't want to live my life as a series of checkboxes anymore. I feel I've already proven myself to mainly myself, but people that I love. And now I want to just be present and reward my body, as funny as that sounds, with care, whether it means you know going to Cairo and massage or sleeping in eating healthy, things that I sometimes earlier on felt I was being selfish. It was the first thing that I'd sacrificed. And now it's the first thing that I've got to start thinking about. And I think it demonstrates to my son too, as he gets older, that respecting your body is an important part of mental health. For a number of months now, I've been wearing a whoop strap. And if they're listening and they want to throw me a couple free months for mentioning it, that'd be awesome. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But You talk about listening to your body, and obviously it made me think of that, that you can only listen to basically maybe how you feel or if you're hydrated. But for me, especially with sleep and then with the strain and how hard you should be pushing that day, it's helped me listen to things that I can't hear, having those metrics to actually look at and connect that to how I'm feeling. So I'm finding some benefit from it. And I know a lot of long distance runners, cyclists, athletes in general, are using them. And you came up as a student athlete and as a runner without that, or maybe just a heart rate monitor. Have you used ones in the past? Do you use one now? Would you consider it? Yeah, well, I did use heart rate monitors kind of at the end of my running career. I mean, the whole fitness industry was revolutionizing with the sharing of data on the internet, just kind of at the tail end of my running career. 
when I follow these distance runners now or any other high caliber athlete, I realize how important technology is to athletic growth. I do use things like the Muse device, sleep tracker stuff through my iWatch. But I'll be honest with you, the reason why I think it's so effective is because things like these indicators as athletes and as firefighters, our brain is so focused on the analytical side of life and outcome based. How much can I lift? How fast can I run this loop? We're so competitive that it overrides a lot of what I call function over feeling. The idea that we behaviorally get through the day, but rarely do we check in with what's really happening on our body. And for stoic men, especially, things like whoop allow us to look at indicators that our brain is just overridden for so long that we need data to show us what's really happening either with our sleep cycles or, like you said, levels of hydration or what have you. Because that type of self-care is the first thing that goes on a daily basis as we grind through an often windy road of life. Yeah, I was sitting on the back step just trying to get some vitamin D before we sat down and chatted. And even though I did the sleep study last night, I didn't sleep great. That's the paradox of that. You go to a sleep study and you get a crappy sleep because of all the wires and everything you're connected to. But what I was thinking about when I was sitting there is that if I had to run a call right now, if I had to do something incredibly taxing, I could do it. Even in that poor recovered state. And I think that's in us that we can always rise to push to our limit and beyond, honestly. But maybe that's too common every day with many of the people that are in the service. Yeah, it's almost like a job requirement, to be honest with you. I mean, I think of how the human brain took 280 million years to evolve and be hardwired to have this fight, flight, freeze, flop reaction. And yet, as first responders, we have to eliminate three of those four primitive stress responses for every call that we attend. And that has consequences. The IFF is only just over 100 years old. There's no way that the human mind has been able to shift and it's hardwired stress response in that amount of time. And to me, that's the basis of psychological stress injuries right there is Regardless of what kind of day you've had or what's going on in your personal life, you don't have a choice to run away or to freeze or to just flop. You have to literally, it's in our job title, fight at every cost. And we do it physically safely, but the emotional impact it has on us is completely overlooked within the culture. We patient care takes precedent over any sort of potential emotional harm that we might suffer. And this is where we see that the last thing to become obvious to other people and to ourselves is the ability to run calls. Mm -hmm. We think, oh, I'm still able to run these calls, so I'm still functional. And everyone around you, when they see you at work running calls, they're like, he's still running calls or she's still running calls, so there isn't an issue. But there actually could be lots of issues. It's just that you're still able to run calls because of that wiring. Yeah. And those calls might be the most meaningful thing in your life. If you're single, recently divorced, struggling maybe off the job with substance use or what have you, some of the members I know that have really struggled have found that running calls is a great distraction for them. And whether it's healthy or not is debatable and depends on the individual. But by the time a psychological injury affects your ability to run calls, you've probably been working wounded for a very long time. And that's been your norm for quite a while. And so when it jeopardizes your calls, or you're making mistakes at work, to me, that's a sign that you're in the red and you need help. So what was your journey to getting on like? Oh, that was interesting. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I went within four months into being fully eligible to work in the fire service. And when I came back from Texas in the fall of, I think, 2011, my friend said to me, listen, my department's hiring. And I was totally keen and really looking forward to trying a hiring process and getting some experience. And it turned out to be one of the biggest regrets of my life. I had been selected for a ride along in this department that I do not work for, by the way really gave me a horrible experience into the fire service. It just shattered my confidence. And I left the third day of that ride along 
wondering, why am I even doing this? The gist of it is, here I am, a distance runner, don't look like the prototypical firefighter, whatever that looks like. (laughs) I don't think it really exists, but it was easy for people to say at that time, oh, I don't want to work with a shrink. And so I felt a sense of shame for the profession I chose and ostracized for it. And all I wanted was a job. And it shattered me for years. And if I had been in my early 20s, I don't know if I would have ever recovered from it. But I had a one-year-old child at home. And it was just so interesting how my profession clouded people's perspective of me that didn't know me. And even to the point where my sexual orientation was in question because I was a counselor. I, 10 years later, look back on that experience and think it had tremendous meaning, but it really shook me to the core for many years. But once again, just like any other obstacle in my life, I think it's what's contributed to how I've been able to influence change for the better in the fire service. I think if people are paying attention when they get on the job, especially for those first few years, they're going to experience disenchantment. Mm Mm-hmm from what they thought the culture and the prototypical was and what it actually is like. Then through that, you either find yourself on the way you do the job or you assimilate or you don't. Yeah, I had this chief at that ride along I was telling you about, take me aside and give me some advice. He goes, Matt, you have two eyes, two ears and one mouth for a reason. And even in that time, I was just like, well, no wonder people don't reach out before they die. You know, I was pissed off right there. I'm like, and this guy is still considered a leader in mental health. And I think he's pretty close to retirement now. But even at that moment, I thought, hmm. So we're saying that we have each other's back. And yet this is what the chief is telling a new recruit that's going to ride along. That's his advice that he gives you. You can probably tell in my voice, I really resented that comment. And I've had four fairly close colleagues die by suicide since I've been hired. And those type of comments that that chief made, to me, contribute so much to the aggravation of a psychological injury, where we're teaching new recruits that and then being surprised that they didn't reach out before they take their lives. What did you expect? Like people to come forward and say, yeah, I'm broken, I'm suicidal to an organization that might be saying that's a sign of weakness just seems so ridiculous to me. That phrase is a lazy and limp and thoughtless way of trying to say, be a student of the craft and a lifelong learner. That's what it should be. But when they put that basic no frills label on it, it hits home on way too many levels, which are negative. Yeah, it's such a dated approach. And, you know, Scott, I've done a lot of research on public safety, mental health. And one of the challenges that we face from an organizational standpoint is that most of the leaders are decades into the service. And how well have they taken care of themselves? Because, I mean, in order to get to the top in these organizations, you've had to sacrifice a lot of yourself for the profession. And so the gatekeepers to progressive mental health initiatives are sometimes the people that are the most unaware of how the jobs impacted them and often have a very traditional view of mental health, which is met with a lot of stoicism and leadership qualities where you flight from vulnerability at all costs. And I think that that's a major barrier that we're facing in terms of real systemic change happening. For them to make a comment, you have two eyes, two ears, one mouth for a reason. Okay, so then my next question is, how long is that true for a firefighter? And when do you have the right to not adhere to it? And at what point did you in your career, speaking to a chief or a leader or even a senior firefighter, decide that it was okay for you to not adhere to it anymore? And now you can talk as much as you want and not listen. Yeah, the rules were just so confusing, right? And I might take that to heart and maybe not then share with my crew how I'm really doing for years, which is how I ended up doing it. But then I saw other people that I were hired with 
you know, being themselves right on day one and going, no, no, the culture is not going to change me. And at first, I kind of resented that approach because I didn't feel that was respectful to the culture. But there are parts of people's personality that I really admire that were just like, no, I am who I am. And it's not a popularity contest. And that's something that I've in the last few years as I've really settled into being a full time firefighter that I'm really celebrating. And it goes back to that call the other day where I'm like, hey, Cap, I want to take the lead here. And short of him giving me a direct order, I really appreciated the independence of me bringing my skill set to something that I think complemented the call and added value. But because of that traditional approach of the two eyes, two ears, one mouth, I've been to so many calls where I really felt like I could make a bigger difference. But because I was afraid to be myself, it prevented me from even suggesting it to captains. And I just walked away with kind of the ABC approach and jump back on the fire truck and move on with my day kind of thing. And if you live your whole fire career like that, I feel like that wears on your soul, not being able to be yourself. Yeah, if you're in an environment or there's a moment you recognize where there's an opportunity for you to learn something, then obviously we should watch and listen more than we speak. Yes. We should also never be afraid to speak up take the lead, take action when we know it's in us and it's the right thing to do, regardless of your years on. Absolutely. I hear you on that. So you mentioned the suicide of colleagues and as hard as it is, I think there's some great value if we discuss it. So maybe you can just expand on that for me and I've got a few questions for you. Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, it is a very sensitive topic. Um, It's something that I've digested over the last four to five years. And I do a lot of teaching for healthcare providers on how to work with first responders. And obviously, this comes up a lot. So I don't want to come across as callous. It's just that I look at this from a fairly analytical perspective now. And so the conversation that we're going to have could have some details in it that really rock people and maybe make it sound like I'm a robot explaining it. But I do want to just mention that these suicides are things that I've spent a lot of time processing and feel very uh, fairly unattached to my emotional reactions at this point about it. So, you know, the first one was a member that was at my fire hall, different shift than me. And my crew was quite close to this individual. And he was the type of guy that really would describe his role as firefighters being the knight in shining armor. And to me, that put a tremendous weight on his shoulders of focusing on outcome and not process. And how do you contain these memories and boundaries if you feel like you're the community watch guard at all time? So when he took his life, I found out I was at work and my crew was quite upset. And it's just interesting where your mind takes you because you're curious how he took his life. And there's that morbid curiosity that first responders are really good at having because we go to, unfortunately, creative ways that people end their lives with. And so my mindset had that type of curiosity right off the bat. And then for me, he had a son around the same age as mine. We know where that goes. You personalize it. And one of the really kind of strange sides to this is that his locker was next to mine. And so it was just very strange for me that now this locker had all his personal belongings in it as if he was coming to work, but he was never coming back. And I was only three years on and three months later, his locker still hadn't been cleaned out. I contacted the union finally and I was like, can we do something about that? So it left a pretty big mark in my fire department and it was considered a line of duty death, which meant that the last fire truck he was in was part of the procession which meant that the day before the funeral, I'm polishing the fire truck and a casket, not with his body, but a casket is loaded into the hose bed of the fire truck. And so, you know, here I am thinking, okay, I signed up for mitigating patient suffering, but I didn't realize there's this cultural grief element to when someone dies that I have to participate in and the planning of and then attending the service. So that was obviously a very challenging event in my fire department. And at the service, there was another member that was quite distraught. 
hit him on a very deep level, but visibly you could tell he was, you know, more shaken than most members at that service. And seven weeks later, he dies by suicide. Mm. So now we've had two suicides in seven weeks in my department. And I'm just reeling and I'm thinking, and I was on the peer support team, still am. So for the first suicide, we have 15 halls in the city I work for. We ran 15 mental health professionals, one at each hall at shift change twice so that every shift had an opportunity to hear a fairly scripted version of what the facts were and then have support from a mental health professional. I mean, my department went above and beyond just trying to find ways to curb what we felt was a crisis at the time. And the feedback from some of our members was, we don't know who these mental health professionals are. They weren't a good fit. Other people were saying it was a great fit, great idea. After our second suicide, we decided, well, why don't we do in-house support where we're doing a fairly scripted version, but we're leading it with peer support rather than mental health professionals because of the feedback we got. A few weeks after the second death, I started hearing members say, well, you cared more about the first guy that died by suicide because you're willing to bring in mental health professionals. (laughs) So that's when I started realizing, hmm, okay, we're complaining that outside healthcare professionals don't get us. We invite them into our house on one of our worst days, we're criticizing them for not getting us. This is where the gap between us and them lies. Sure, mental health professionals may advertise their services as really getting us, and they don't, but there's no training outside civilians on how to work with this very unique culture. So to me, that was where a light bulb went off. We can do a better job of preparing healthcare providers. And also, part of preparing healthcare providers is recognizing that your level of popularity with first responders is going to be just like our level of popularity in our department, which is maybe 75% of guys like us, 10% kind of neutral, and then there's maybe 15% that for some reason they don't like you. So I really felt like healthcare providers needed to realize that if you think you're going to be working with a guy that pats you on the back every time you give a good reflective comment, you're going to be short on pats on the back. So that was the second suicide. Now that summer, a member that was hired just before me became a paraplegic in a water accident. And then we had another member die off duty in a low velocity impact motorcycle accident. Within three months, we lost 1% of our membership. And then one of my best friend's brother's who was another firefighter in the Lower Mainland Department, dying by suicide in my friend's parents' house. So I had multiple levels of suicides, and it was just so overwhelming to figure out where we were going as a culture and what my role was in it. And I knew I could find some meaning out of it, but at the time I was really at a loss of how do you make meaning out of all these lives being lost around you? There's so much there. My first thought on the desire to know details was we're wired for that as well, where we go to a scene and no matter how bad it is, we need to know all the details. So perhaps we carry that forward to when it's someone that's close to us. Absolutely. And I think that's part of the problem. And I know the research, it might be Thomas Joyner at Florida State University, speaks about just the comfort that we have with lethality. This idea of seeing so many different ways people have died kind of normalizes the experience for some members. And when you pair that with compassion fatigue, where you've gone to so many suicides, not only does it normalize it, but it might also strip some of the humanity away from that person, where you forget that they're a son or a husband or a father. And That stripping of humanity that happens sometimes over the years as we feel like we've seen everything, I think is a major warning sign for psychological injuries. And, you know, in the fire service, our pension's great. We talk all about how retirement's going to be, how many years of service I need to get that formula. But to me, the clincher is when is the time to go so that you can leave with thinking that your mental health is still intact and that you're starting a new part in your book rather than one of the last chapters in it. 
Yeah, we stay at the party too long sometimes. A hundred percent. You know, getting back to me taking care of my body, that's where I've realized my mental health is going to suffer long term if I don't become more mindful of my body. And it's interesting. I do active yoga almost every morning of my day shift at the fire hall as soon as I arrive before truck check and what have you, because I want to start associating my mind with a fire hall that my first entry point in my set is paired with breathing and physical health. I really think that that is such an important part to undoing some of the hard wiring of walking into a fire hall and not noticing that your heartbeat's increasing, your blood pressure's increasing, your palms are a bit sweaty. One of the things I do know about myself is physiologically, my stress response is fairly calm. But I know that a lot of members struggle with a lot of anxiety that they don't even think is anxiety. It's the male version of it. You got a laundry list of things to do. So you're thinking about it all night. No, no, that's anxiety. It's not about sitting in the corner like a child and crying that you lost your stuffed animal. This is a type of male anxiety that just isn't spoken about. And it's costing us lives. It's costing us marriages. It's costing us a happy, healthy retirement. And this isn't just in the fire service. This is in any profession where a flight from vulnerability exists as you wear this emotional armor to protect ourselves, primarily as men. It's not exclusively a gender issue, but from my personal experience, men in general are in an absolute mental health crisis, and we're not talking about it at a social level. We're talking about other types of movements that are justifiable, but men's mental health has been crumbling for decades, and only now are we starting to talk about permission to share it without feeling like it's questioning your manhood. But that shift has taken so long and we're just not there yet. Again, taking it to that full level of it doesn't even bring you to neutral. It actually makes you better at your job. If you actually want to be the strongest, bravest, best firefighter, those people address this part of themselves. Yes. And what I try and teach healthcare providers is how you frame the therapeutic encounter with first responders because they are obviously going in often in crisis and very tightly wound and think if they share their emotions, they're going to unspool. And it's a very realistic, rational thought. It's a protective measure. Yeah, absolutely. It's a way to keep things together. What I try and teach healthcare providers is the analogy of taking a knee in therapy to be strong out on the front line so that Your services are actually complementary to contributing in a meaningful way to their health on the job, rather than leaving it uncontained and having someone drop out after the first or second therapy session, which is still very common. That's a fundamental problem we're having when our colleagues reach out for help. I also had the thought as you were talking about the perception of mental health professionals coming in, is that there's two sides of that relationship. And I think sometimes the idea of us being unique, quote unquote, is a bit of a badge to be proudly worn when there are some unique factors, but we're not that unique. Trauma is trauma, and there are people that are educated and empathetic and compassionate to help you through that. And also a piece of confirmation bias that ties in there where not all counselors are great. And if we could just realize that from You have that disenchanting moment and you finally wake up and the bubble bursts and you realize not all firefighters are great. Maybe you could extend that same mentality to mental health professionals. So when you meet one that's not that great, it doesn't mean they're not all great. (laughs) Exactly. When I help people find a clinician here in BC, I often say finding a mental health professional is like looking for a new vehicle. There's different makes and models. So test drive a few before you make a decision. What I'm doing is I'm priming the normalization or the experience that there's a good chance you're not going to find a great fit right off the bat. Especially if you're in crisis. Yeah, absolutely. Like you're broken down on the side of the road and your only recourse is to grab the first car that comes over the hill. How lucky are you going to be? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, to take that analogy a little bit further is maybe that vehicle isn't running properly and might break down down the road. And to me, that's the equivalent of having a clinician that isn't competent in working with first responders. 
And that's okay because there's someone in a first responder family that that clinician would probably work really well with, whether it's their child, their spouse, or what have you. But right now, the mental health landscape is so fragmented and unregulated across Canada that it's nearly impossible to find a vetted clinician beyond just word of mouth. And when you do find them, they tend to have full caseloads because they're good at what they do. I really want to touch on what you mentioned about how you intentionally are reframing your workplace to set yourself up for your day and your shift. I think if people are honest, there's probably many times where you're driving and you're about to pull into the driveway of the station and you have this feeling like, ugh, I don't want to be here today. Yeah. It's not that you don't like your job or you don't like your workplace. That might be part of it. I'm just approaching it from you like your job, you like your workplace, you're overwhelmed and you know what could potentially be coming. Yes. We can't take that factor away, but we could at least make the station a place of healing and solace. So when you go run the calls and you come back, okay, this is where I heal. Yes. You know, it's interesting timing when you say that comment. It brings me back to a few weeks ago when I had COVID. And obviously, seeing a doctor has become very challenging in society right now. And my doctor needed to fill out a medical update form for my employer. He was just having phone-based appointments. And of course, it was the same day that the Rogers wireless network was down across Canada. So I realized 10 minutes before my appointment that I'm going to have to have an email appointment with him. That's how my return to work form got filled out. And unfortunately, it was about four or five days before he said I would be going back to full duties. And I was laying on the couch thinking to myself, how is my body going to respond to a structure fire? If I'm going into a building that's 150 degrees and I've got my irons and fully kitted up and I'm weighing 150 more pounds, what kind of stress is that doing to my body? Is my body going to fail me? Yeah, I don't want to be a stat. So I actually ended up telling the employer I'm not feeling up for it, that my medical status has changed. And, you know, in our culture, that is a very tough thing to do because a medical doctor has told you no you're cleared for work and now you're saying well no my doctor got it wrong well <laughs> i haven't had a in person assessment to see how much covid has affected my body so anyways i really uh appreciate that i stood up for myself and said no i need another week off and because of that i returned to work feeling much more grounded and calm because I went to the hospital actually to have things checked out because you get to become a kind of a hypochondriac with these chest discomfort and what have you. And once, you know, they did an ultrasound in my heart and did an EKG and a chest x-ray and said COVID hasn't affected these organs, kind of whoop moment, right? <laughs> of going, okay, my brain can't process what's happening to my organs because they don't have the same pain sensors that my skin have. I can't physically see how my body is doing inside. And going back to these sleep health indicators or whatever kind of fitness data that this technology now brings us, that's the type of reassurance that I need to go, yeah, I'm ready. And because of that, when I came back to work, I felt present, I felt calm, and I felt like I could do the job. If I had returned the set earlier when I powered through going against my body's best wishes, I would have been riddled with anxiety and second guessing, and it wouldn't have been good for my career long term. Yeah, we really shouldn't be coming in unless we're ready to do the hardest call that we could be asked to do. What you did was actually the most respectful thing to yourself, to your crew, to the department, and to the people that you're going to help. Yeah, I felt that. Up until probably two years ago, I wouldn't have had the courage to change it up. I would have just powered through it. And I think a lot of members end up doing that. And that's kind of why they need hip replacements and knee replacements in their 40s and early 50s. I don't want to be that type of person on the job. I don't think it does uh, the culture any good either. I want to touch back one more time on losing people to suicide before we move on. Okay. You mentioned in your notes to me that you're also talking to one of the members that was struggling and that you lost. So I think it'd be safe to say that when people die by suicide, that the people close to them feel some sense of wishing that they knew that they were suffering so deeply. Yeah. 
And if they did know, it's even harder to process because it's easy to tell ourselves that we didn't do enough to prevent it. But there's limitations on what we could do mentally and physically for people in normal life, let alone people in such dark places. Yes. So was it even more difficult for you because you knew and you were trying to help and that you'd worked in the mental health field? I just feel that that's so many layers to have on you. And what I want to get out of this is how can people come to terms with their loss and misplaced guilt? And how did you process it and be kind and honest with yourself through that time? Yeah, 2015 was a really tough summer for me. But where a turning point for how I viewed it happened was hearing from a suicide expert out of McGill, Dr. Brian Mashara, I believe is his name. He framed, and I don't want to quote him, but he so eloquently said, like, the vast majority of humans contemplate suicide at some point in their lives. Very few of us will take action on that. And I thought to myself, I get what you're saying. Instead of being afraid of thinking about that reality, why not just realize that this is maybe a normal reaction to just how stressful life can be? And it might be a stretch to think of it this way, but like when I was a kid, you know, when a moving train was happening in front of me, I wanted to jump on it. I never did because it would be too dangerous and it would be like, well, where is this train taking me? But that interest you see on YouTube, these kids jumping off these bridges and diving into water that you think would just break their neck. That's a natural urge, this risk taking kind of Red Bull kind of way of of living life. For me, when I heard about this vast majority of humans think of suicide, it allowed me to not be afraid of having this catastrophic thought that might happen to me in my life. And it's really safeguarded me to realizing that that's just something that I don't think will ever happen to me. But it certainly rattles you when you see senior members taking their life. And a lot of us younger people were thinking in 2015, well, is this the inevitable trajectory of working in this department? Is this what's going to happen to me in another 4,000 calls? It goes along the curiosity of how someone dies by suicide, the chain reaction in your mind that happens. But for your listeners out there, if there's one thing they can take from hearing my experience is that suicide is always going to happen. It's been around since the dawn of time for humans. It's tragic. We need to do the best we can to be a brother and a sisterhood for each other. Because for some members, they feel a false sense of brotherhood and sisterhood. And they live their career feeling marginalized. And when we lose that sense of belonging, whether it's within our family or a workplace, that's a very lonely spot to be in. And I've experienced feeling invisible and feeling lonely like most people have. But for those struggling out there listening to this, it's temporary, the struggle. I realize that really tough situations in life come to an end, just like really good situations in life come to an end. And so I just try and ride gentle waves of life without trying to ride a tsunami where I'm fighting up against a wave that's going to crest on me. So 2015, that wave was pretty big. It crested on me and it crested on a lot of members. The silver lining of the fire service is that the weight of that wave is somehow lessened by the small army of the fire service that has to ride it together. As a mental health professional, I had to deal with things on the second floor all by myself. The fire service, two in, two out, minimum. To me, that's where collective loss and grief can be contained and meaning can happen in a positive way so that we continue to thrive rather than just surviving and working wounded. And that's what I really hope for in all first responder cultures that we're moving towards. Talk to me about your perception of the difference between being self-critical and being self-aware, because many members have survived and achieved success or quote unquote what they think success is or achieve goals by having what they see as different standards for themselves and they'll speak to themselves in a way they would never speak to anyone else and they think that's okay. Yeah. So talk to me about how you've shifted that and practice more self-awareness versus self-criticism. 
The shift for me happened mainly through a book I read years ago by Dr. Rick Hansen, very well-known author out of the San Francisco Bay Area. And what I love about where my career has taken me is I've gotten to know Rick on a personal level, and he's a neuropsychologist. And he talks about how the brain is hardwired to have this negativity bias where bad experiences stick like Velcro and good experiences slide off like Teflon. Part of that saying is that if you can name it, you can tame it. All these little catchphrases have really stuck with me over the years where I'm realizing that, yeah, the vast majority of our thoughts are negative and self-critical. And we're going to tell ourselves things that we would never criticize our worst enemy by saying. And because the brain is hardwired to survive by seeing threat much more than we see positive experience, the older I get, the more aware I get of normalizing these experiences and catching myself with just little things like the road rage I had in my 20s versus now. It's just not worth having. You get cut off. I still might give a dirty look or something like that, and then I move on with my day. But for some people, I mean, you see it in driving habits, right? They're on the guy's tail, and you can tell it's just adding stress to their already stressful day. And What's the outcome that you think you're going to achieve from it? Yeah, there's going to be nothing, right? Other than it stressed you out even more. And what were you racing home for anyways to watch TV or, you know, it's just so trivial what our stressors are in modern day that it distracts us from what's really important in life. It's just a sad reality that so many of us are facing. Well, I'm glad that you've survived and even thrived from all the challenges that you faced from childhood till now and that you've processed things the way you have. I think what you've had to offer is a huge benefit to people and your crew and your department, they're lucky to have you. Well, thanks, Scott. This is a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for giving me uh, time to be a guest on your podcast and you keep up the great work too.